And we are live. We are live. We're live. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello. From Business Network and on my personal page. This is being live streamed on um, both platforms. Um, as usual, I give people about five minutes to join in the live broadcast before we get started. Um, tonight, mm -hmm. we have a very special guest and a very special topic. So we have sort of switched gears tonight. Mm -hmm. Usually, we're talking about um, business subjects. But tonight, we, we're just changing it up a little bit. This is the uh, self-reflection and healing series mm -hmm. um, that we've started. So I'm going to give people time to come in the broadcast and then I'll introduce my guests and then we'll get it popping like we always do. So okay. we have about five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Let me see. It tells me the time. Okay. So yeah. So we, I, I, when we get to five minutes, now we're at about a minute, uh, a little bit over a minute. When we get to five minutes, we'll get started with the broadcast. Okay. So I see people coming in. We give them about five minutes. Depending on how many people come in, we may give them three minutes and get started. Okay. And this is when I need that music I was talking about. <laughs> for uh, a couple yeah. of weeks. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I will um, have my music so that mm -hmm. we can be sitting in awkward silence while we wait for people <laughs> on the broadcast but yeah i need some you know my own little music yeah uh, that i can play and i won't have to be infringing on anybody else's uh copyright <laughs> that's true you got to be careful yeah especially um uh, in these days so <laughs> yeah so we're at two minutes now i'm giving them about three more minutes to come in okay so we can get started i am so excited um about this series okay and hopefully it will help it will help mm -hmm. many people <laughs> it'll help <laughs> other women it may help some men or whatever yeah, that would I'm be excited good. About, about this um series so we have um got about maybe two more minutes and then we're going to get started okay should break out in a song come on in the room <laughs> can you see the timer on your your end uh-uh oh yeah i do live 3.17 okay okay yeah, yeah so when it gets to five okay the five minutes we'll go ahead and we'll get started okay Yeah. I've never used this platform before, so it's going to be interesting. Well, StreamYard, it's it's I I, I like it more than um, some of the other platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can do so much with StreamYard. Okay. So and it's 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 very um flexible you can okay. you can add banners you can do all, all types of stuff oh um, okay. stream yard. so it's one of the better platforms for you know live broadcast if you ask me plus um when you're on um stream yard you can broadcast or do these live streams from several different platforms you know you can have it because right now it's oh. on page and then it's on a black home business networks page okay um, so you can put you can have it at, at several different places at one time and you can have up to 10 people on here oh okay that's and awesome. I, i'm sure that's very interesting yeah <laughs> with 10 people 10 people who come uh, first yeah <laughs> yeah so we have about 15 seconds and then we're going to go ahead and get started Okay. People have come in the room. Yo. Yo. 
Okay, it is uh, 7.05. We are going to get started again. Um, let me introduce myself for people who do not know, but mostly everybody does know. I'm Tiffany Banks. I am the founder of the Black Owned Business Network. And today my guest is Miriam Wallace. She is the author of Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters. Right. Um, this is her book right here. So um, before we get started, I just wanted to say that earlier I, I was speaking about how we were just switching it up a little bit. Last week we were talking about, I want to say life insurance. The week before that, it was something else that has to do <laughs> um, with business. So I know it's sort of throwing people for a loop like, okay, so now we're in a healing series. <laughs> what exactly does this have to do with business? Right. And um, honestly, it has everything to do with business, especially in our community. Um, believe it or not, if we are not healed and whole people, it affects various areas of our lives. And that includes business. So I think that my approach, um, even with business, is to start um, from the top. Mm -hmm. We, we want to address, you know, things from the top on down. So I think it is very, very important that mm -hmm. while we are talking about business things, that we actually talk about other things that are relevant to the community. Right. And uh, self-reflection and healing, uh, those are two of those things that we need to talk about in a community. We are not just um, business-based. We are community-based as well. So right. I just wanted to get that disclaimer out there and right. um, so that we can move forward. So again, ooh, I have something flying around me. Um, my guest tonight is Marion Wallace. And her Hello, everyone. It's Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters. Mm -hmm. um, I am going to first start off. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, how are you doing, Marion? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm doing good. How are you? I'm excited I'm to be here. Good. I'm doing good. I am excited to have you here. Um, on the network discussing your uh, book. Mm -hmm. So um, the title of the book is Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters. Right. The title is what initially drew me in because I'm like, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, what is this about? <laughs> what is this about? I mean, really, it's a very intriguing name. It's, it made yeah. me want to um, find out what the book was about. Right. And... Um, I just thought, you know, the name just drew me in. So tell me about how you decided on that name. And also you can go into telling me what was your inspiration behind okay. writing this book? Okay. Well, I wanted to write a book about um, the lives of um, children growing up in the ghetto, the hoods of America. And I was thinking about a name. I said, well, what can I call it? Well, but I'm, uh, it's really based for females, but it can help anyone. So I said, well, get those forgotten daughters because many times people from the ghetto or the hoods are poverty stricken. Nobody cares about us. We're thrown away. We're marginalized. And so I just wanted to say, hey, enough of us not being remembered. It's time for us to be unforgettable. So get those forgotten daughters was, was my title. I just came up with it like that. And then my motivation for writing the book was honestly, God, my connection to God. He wanted me to tell my story. Initially, I didn't know how I was going to tell it. I was like, well, OK, OK, let me go backwards. I had just purchased my house. I had got a house built. I was a single mom after going through a lot of stuff. And I got into my house and I, I remember falling asleep um, on my floor because I, my bed wasn't put up yet. But I remember as I was in a, a deep sleep, God came to me and he told me I needed to tell my story. A lot of people ask, well, well was it audible? You know, could, could you hear him talking to you? He, God can communicate with your spirit. And so after that victory, that big, it was a big victory for me because I come from the hood where we were homeless half the time. And so for me to go and buy my own house, get my own house built alone, that was nothing but God's blessings towards me. So I did owe him that much. So he came to me one time and I was like, no, I don't want to tell my story. I'm embarrassed. I have a lot of guilt and shame still attached to my story. So I was like, no, I don't want to tell my story. I told him no the first time. And then the second time he came back around, it was more profound. 
It was more pronounced. And I can't explain it unless you've communicated with God through your spirit. You, you, you won't understand what I'm saying. But it was like he commanded me to tell my story that second time. And I was like, OK, I'll tell my story. And that's how it came about. It's really simple. It had nothing to do with me because me, I wouldn't have told it. You know, if it was just my flesh, my flesh was saying no. But the spirit was saying, yeah, you need to tell your story because there's people all over the world that need to hear this message about how so many children grow up in the ghettos of America or the hoods that, you know, we don't have a choice of who, what parents we have or what cir circumstances we go through, how poor we are. We're just kind of thrown in it. But people need to know that just because you're thrown in it, there's a way out of it. Not that the, the that all the hit the ghettos or the hoods are all bad because there's some good things in it, but most people don't know a lot of the bad stuff that goes along. So that's why this book is so important to me. Okay, so um, when we talk about the hoods, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say that I I. So every hood is not bad, but there right. are uh, some characteristics that we see in most hoods, especially if we, you know, are um, relating to the the word ghetto, because mm -hmm. uh, we have this picture in our mind. We we know we know what it is. Yeah, um, <laughs> pretty much we, we 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 know what it is. Um, right now we are having. Um, well, not right now, because this is, has, has been going on for a while now, but mm -hmm. I was just shocked a couple of years ago to learn that black girls, black women and girls, you know, or, or I want to say black girls, because even before they get to adulthood, mm -hmm. um, before it went, you know, between, you know, this age and childhood and 18, mm -hmm. almost 80% or if not more than 80% of black girls have been, have, have experienced some kind of sexual assault, rape, mm, molestation. It's some kind of inappropriate sexual right. encounter. Um, so the first thing, when, when you go into your book, you start describing your early life. First, right. you talk about the abuse um, mm. of your mother, witnessing right. your father and your uh, mother abuse your mother. Uh -huh. That was something that I could directly relate to um, okay. because I was a witness of abuse as well. So mm -hmm. that was the first thing that you spoke about. And mm -hmm. then as we moved a little bit forward, you talked about being molested by a family mm -hmm. friend at the mm -hmm. age of five. I want to say at the age of five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about the abuse mm -hmm. and molestation? Okay. Uh, the abuse part from as early as I can remember, it was very chaotic and it was, uh, it was scary. Um, the, the first parts of my life and my siblings lives was, uh, there was a lot of trauma involved. So I didn't grow up like, you know, normal kids. Uh, and my, my brothers didn't either. I have three brothers. I'm the only girl. Um, but can you imagine somebody like as early as that you can remember like two years old and you wake up to glass shattering and your mother's hollering and screaming and begging for her life. And then you see in her, both of her eyes closed shut and you see blood everywhere. And, and can you even imagine that's a two year old from as early as you can remember, there was trauma, there was abuse. The very person or the people that was supposed to covet you and protect you didn't. So that's at two, you know, that's as early as I can remember. There was nothing but trauma. And it was where I learned how to love incorrectly. It's where I learned how to love and give love incorrectly. This is key because a lot of people are in relationships today, loving people the wrong way and accepting people the wrong way, all because of how they were reared at their early ages. Because we learn a bulk of what the type of personality we're going to be. But I think they said by the age of five or seven. So all of that stuff that we're taking in, you know, that's why we're growing up so traumatized and fearful and all these other things. So that was the abuse. And as for the molestation, it was just all because 
You know, my father was not a protector. He wasn't a protector. He wasn't much of a, of a provider. And my mother couldn't protect us because she couldn't protect herself. Mm -hmm. So it was one, one uh, late night. I had to say it was around maybe 10 or 11 o'clock. Uh, what grown man do you know want to stay around and watch your kids while you go to the store? <laughs> yeah. That's a red flag. It's a red flag. Yeah, but so he wanted to watch us while my parents went to the grocery store, you know, and I just don't get how my dad couldn't protect us, you know, how he didn't even think that was wrong because he was so high or drunk or whatever he was. So this all happened when he, we took our baths, we laid down. And it wasn't until we all fell asleep. So my parents had to be gone for, they weren't gone that long, but they were gone long enough for this man to violate me. And all of this happened while my brothers, we all slept in the same room. While they were sleeping in the room, I was getting molested. So, yeah. It's, so can you imagine this child from as early as she can remember that she it was nothing but abuse and then there was molestation and then there was never a time in my childhood that I felt safe. Never. And even though I can say God genuinely has healed me from a lot of that trauma, I still battle with trauma. I still oh, battle. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it never goes away. Right. That's what people don't understand. It's like, I really don't sleep well. I have nightmares. Sometimes I go back and, 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 and it's just horrible. And I mean, is, I mean, is, sleep, I'm thinking I'm praising God, Lord, I slept, you know? It's uh healing is uh it's not a one and done. People yeah. think it is like, well, you said you you've healed from this, that, and other. No, it's a process and it's a continual process. You you it's just like being on drugs. So yeah. for the rest of your life, you have to stay away from this drug. At the rest of your life, you you are fighting mm -hmm. against you know this addiction. So it's the and same with healing. Yeah, you have um, triggers. Yeah, you do. You mm -hmm. do have triggers. And um, I want to say for myself, um, with witnessing abuse of, of my my mother, um, that yeah. I I really like I was so young. I, yeah. I was young just like you were, and um I didn't really have um a bad bad you know I, I wasn't really like oh you know i didn't think my dad was a horrible person uh -huh. i didn't because it was times where you know he did good things as well um and it wasn't until i got an adult because this is how trauma works mm -hmm. i thought i was fine actually yeah I grew up and all this yeah. stuff I'm fine. i mean honey that's in the past i ain't, that ain't got no effect yeah <laughs> you know? so I'm, I'm living my life and then i started noticing that there was a pattern of things um, that I was doing. And then, you know, like, why am I behaving like this in relationships? Why am I behaving like this mm -hmm. with, with these people over here or whatever? And that that was it. It was yeah. because of the abuse. So sometimes, or, or, or witnessing the abuse, which is also a form of abuse to the child. See what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes we when the situation is over or, or we've grown up or whatever um mm -hmm. then we think that we're fine because i honestly thought i was fine like hey, oh i mean that was back then it's over mm -hmm. you know over and done with or whatever that's what he did back then but then one day i was like uh-uh yeah. then and i i really started despising my dad like yeah like him i you know i had some very harsh words mm -hmm. and thoughts um about yeah. him so yeah that's what it does people think that um because you're over it but that thing creeps back up oh yeah it's it's called triggers yeah you get a trigger yeah like, honestly, i have to stay away from my dad i love him i'll send him christmas gifts you know father's day gifts but i and we live in the same city but i can't see him because he triggers me because he hasn't changed you know it'd be different if he had changed but he was an alcoholic he's still an alcoholic so when he drinks he's an angry drunk so if i go around him he's an angry drunk mm -hmm. so then it takes me back and i can't make progress or stay moving ahead if i'm always taken back to my traumas so i can't even see him anymore 
Right. And so some people think that, oh, well, if you can't do that again, you're not really healed. And that's not the truth because you can be healed and you can be use wisdom as well. Wisdom is staying away from your triggers or people, especially if a person has not changed, you have no obligation to be around a person that's not changed, especially if you're on your own healing journey. You don't have an obligation to those people. Right. You just move on and wish wish them well. You know, that's healing. Say, I, I wish the best for you. I forgive you. Yeah, I forgive you, but I'm done. But I'm, but I'm over here. Yeah. So um, from there, um, the molestation, mm-hmm. you you ended up running away from home. Mm-hmm. And um, then I was... Yeah, yeah. You, you ended up running away from home. And then there was a rape. Yeah. And I want to say the rape was at 15 years old. Yeah, I was, was 15. 15. Okay, so just lead us up from the part where you were running away. Um, people probably can uh, make the assumption to why you were running away because we yeah. just talked about abuse. But just explain to them, you know, from the running away part up until. Okay. You- um, I believe that maybe me and a friend had gotten in trouble at school. And I know my dad was going to go left. And I just... But it was stuff leading up to me running away. It was just like my dad started to behave in ways that made me feel like that I was next. And I won't say too much because my brother's got some some um, stories to tell. So until they come out with their stories, I, I, I can't speak on them. But I just felt like, OK, this is only getting worse. It's only progressing it's, and and. I just felt like I was in more danger than just that part of the abuse. There was more heading towards it. And so with me getting in trouble and me realizing my time was very limited there, I just say, you know, forget it. I'm gone. I'm I'm just going to run away. I'm going to run for my life uh, without knowing that I was running from one hell to the other because um. I went to a friend's house, but this friend had this brother and this, that's the the person that raped me because I was a virgin still, you know, because you can be molested. And and if you're molested and penetration doesn't happen, Uh then you're still considered a virgin. So I was still a virgin at that point. And as my parents was knocking on the door, looking for me, he was raping me. Wow. So I was going, you know, I went from one trauma to the other, to the other, to the other. That's That was my life story. And it's just amazing that I'm in my right mind right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it is. Um, people, when you said you was a virgin, I just wanted to go back to that. Because when people think all molestation is not uh, penetration, I need for right. people to understand what molestation is. And you need to make sure that your children understand what molestation is. Mm-hmm. Molestation is any appropriate, inappropriate yeah. sexual touch, sexual touch, act, yeah, or act yeah. or whatever with with the child. That's what yeah. molestation is. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it does not have to um, be about sexual penetration, but it's an, an inappropriate sex act or touching mm-hmm. uh, with the child. So um, you were raped by your friend's brother. Mm-hmm. And um, then in a the book, you talk about um, from there, just hanging out, mm-hmm. doing whatever just you know. Doing, doing my thing. Because they were so restricted there. Like, we couldn't, like, I couldn't walk to the store with, you know, well, really nowadays, it's not safe to walk to your, walk to the store. But in our neighborhood, we kind of all knew each other. And I just felt like it, everything was just so restricted. We couldn't go to games. We couldn't go to the store. We couldn't do anything but be locked up in this hell hole. So that's how my dad treated us. And so just being free from that, I just wanted to experience some freedom. Mm-hmm. I, it may have, I may have went about it the wrong way, but yet and still it was my piece of freedom. So yeah, yeah I hung out with my friends, but and we went to clubs. They let us in. They let us drink. They let us smoke weed. They let us do whatever we wanted to do. Now, you know, there should have been some people there saying no. Mm-hmm. But in the hood, nobody cares how young mm-hmm. you are. No, you know, they, they don't. They benefit from your ignorance or your youth. So, Right. They, they'll, they'll take advantage of that. Mm-hmm. They'll, they'll take advantage of that. Actually, there are people 
uh, that pray, they can actually see a vulnerability yeah. in you. Yeah, when you're, covered, yeah, yeah, when you're not covered. Yeah, when you're not covered, they, they right, do. right. They'll take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, so you were hanging out and everything, and this is where we get into um, relationships. Yeah. So there's well, we we have this. I don't want to say it's a uh, black woman, black man war, but yeah. it's something going on. It's something going on. I, I don't want to, yeah. you know, it's something going on. But um, every now and then you'll see uh, a meme or something like that that shows a young woman that didn't want this type of guy. She wanted mm -hmm. the hood. She wanted the thug. Mm -hmm. She wanted the drug dealer mm -hmm. and all of this stuff. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, if you are growing up in these type of environments, you that's say, all that's out there. That's all. That's all you see. That's all you see. Sometimes people see it as a way out. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Because look, home is worse. Home right. is worse. So right. Yeah. So let me get with this guy because he seems like he's powerful. He has some money. Mm -hmm. He has all the things that you know I I need and I want. Mm -hmm. And you know. uh what 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 happened as far as uh the guys that you were choosing when you well were, you um, were just out? when i was out having fun yeah this this kind of followed me throughout my um adulthood though too but um i was basically choosing men like my father i was choosing men that was um disrespectful that was morally corrupt that were, I wouldn't identify my dad as a thug, but he was, he was drug dependent. He was alcohol dependent. He was abusive. He was, you know, maybe even narcissistic, all these traits that these, uh, these younger guys had. I just realized at the end of it, when, when I, when God taught me why I was the way that I was, it was because I was mimicking what was going on with my parents, with other people. And people don't understand it. And I hate when I see men or I even see women laugh and mock. And that's why that's another reason why I named this book um, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters. When they look at young girls from the hood that make these horrible decisions, there's a reason why they're making bad decisions. It's everything that they know. It's it's normalized in their psyche. So unless you've been there, you really can't judge that person for thinking that way. They have to change their perception. So, you know, it was everything I knew. It was, it was normal, even though it wasn't normal to people that hadn't been through it. But to us, it, that's just the way it is. That's the way of life. And, hey. Yeah, so that's, that's one thing that I think that we need to discuss a lot. Um, when people sit down and say, well, well, why would you do this? And why would you, why would you choose that? And why would you have all these children and why and because if that's the only thing if that's the mm -hmm. only thing you know that you know i looked at a uh, a show or it, it was something they were talking about you know people what's going on in chicago and some of these places where all this violence is, has been occurring right and um they were talking about some of the people they've never mm -hmm. even taken a flight out of there they've never left this that area that area mm -hmm. so if it's all that you know, then that's what you'll do. You'll just mimic what you're used to seeing. Mm -hmm. So if this is a guy, you know, that you, you see, or this is what you see going on, this is the behavior you'll mm -hmm. have until you see something different, different. until you learn something different. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons why we're even talking about this. Because if we can let people know, like, you know, let, let young women know, before they make these mistakes or whatever, mm -hmm. um, then maybe they can avoid them. Now, I know that there are some mm -hmm. of us that have to learn. Learn. <laughs> I was Why? Those, Why? I, I was one of those people that had to learn because yes. I did hear have somebody in my ear saying, girl. <laughs> yeah, you just don't know. <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> don't do this. I mean, because 
this right here will get you that over there. And I was like, honey, I'm not saying what you're talking about. You want to do what you want to do. They still the same way nowadays. Yeah. They still the same way. Yeah. They so we have to strength. find, we have to find an effective way. Right. I want to say that the reason that I did not listen uh, to the person that was in my ear was because <laughs> you can say a lot of things mm -hmm. but if you're not showing me mm -hmm. like show me what's better don't tell me what's better there you go show me and nobody you know, can show us right everybody was doing the same thing i can remember and i think i even have that in my book i can remember growing up in these apartments and i can remember like abuse was happening in my home but then i could walk down the hallway and see other women being abused wow it was happening everywhere. Drugs was everywhere. Abuse was everywhere. You know. And but then you, want, and you expect for these kids to grow up and do something with their lives. Right. And if you grew up in the era where, where crack was on the scene or whatever. Yeah. You you were involved in drugs because either you had, had a family member on drugs. Mm -hmm. You sold drugs. Yeah. Or you dated somebody that was selling drugs. Selling drugs. So everybody that was... It. was it, everybody was connected in some kind of way, and that's all you saw. Mm -hmm. That's all we'll you it. saw. So, uh, yeah, it, it has to be. And you know what? It's it's like, so we're talking about this. Like, this is something that happened a long time ago. Right. And it's not something that, it, it is something that happened, you know, not a long time ago, but it's still happening. Yeah, it's still happening. Right, yeah. it's still happening. So we, you know, I moved from the city a long time ago. I can remember um, moving back to the city. I said, I, I wanna live in a city. And um, when I had been away from the city so long that I had become disconnected from the community. Mm -hmm. Like I, I grew up in the, in the crack era and all of that stuff. So I, I know how bad it was or whatever, you know, some yeah. of my high school friends were selling drugs or, whatever it was selling them to my own family members yeah <laughs> you know what I'm saying? so yeah, i know um about that but i moved back to the city and i moved to an area that was being gentrified mm -hmm. but you know how it's not all the way gentrified so you have you know still these parts that you know yeah they're still kind of down here and then yeah. you have this part so i was like right there and I would snap back into reality because I would see people still on drugs, hanging out, doing stuff, you know, people on, on crack and whatever. Yeah. And I was like, you mean tell me people still on crack? This yeah. Still, this, this is the type of stuff that this is still going on. It's still going on. If I go to my old hood, it, it's just, it's, it's evolved. It's gotten worse. But when you say evolved, like, what ways do you see it as worse? Like the kids are younger now. Mm -hmm. Like they're strung out on drugs at 12, 13, you know, like early. They're, you know, back back in my era, they even had, you know, young girls were strung out. I, I had a friend that was strung out on crack. She she was younger than me. So if I was 15, she was younger than me. Wow. And then, you know what I'm saying? And then you got to pay for it somehow, right? Right. So, and she's prostituting. So, but it's still, it, it's evolving in a sense to, to where they're actually younger. And they, and I, I just feel like they're, they're more lost. I don't know. I could be wrong, but I just feel like it's, it's this darkness that's just kind of overtaking our youth. I, I, and that's, I, I agree with that. And it's like, how do we help them? You know, how? So that's why I had, joined a ministry to go out to Harris County Juvenile Jail System. And I, mm -hmm. I mentored young girls that was incarcerated for over five years to kind of give them my testimonial to help them see a better way out. Because it's hard for people to tell you to do right when they're doing wrong. Right. But if you can see people that's been in that situation that, that actually is evolving and growing and moving, then maybe you can follow it. And so that's why I did that. But there's still so much more work for us to do. There's 
there's so much more work. We need to go in the, you know, in these areas and, and give people hope and give them light. Right. So um, moving forward in the book, mm -hmm. um, it was what? like you, you, you went from one relationship to the next, mm -hmm. like in search of something. So mm -hmm. uh, while you were moving mm -hmm. through these relationships, mm -hmm. you were having children. Right. And there's one part in this book that says something about you were having children and you were a mother. I can't, I think I highlighted it, but okay. You, you, you said that I hated the thought of even being a mom. So I was a bad one. Yeah, and I was a bad one. When I read that, I was like, Oh, oh yeah. At the beginning, I, I was not a good mother. I didn't know how to be a mother. You know? So it, go, it goes back to what we were talking about. And the reason that stood, it, it just like sent chills up my spine because um, nobody wants to admit that they're, they were a bad mother. I admitted a lot of stuff in that book. I admitted a lot. I, I'm I very transparent. I, look, <laughs> it, 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 it resonated with me because um, when I was raising my older children, like, mm -hmm. and I, well, I'm the type of person that, um, and I, I've been working on myself. I've been working on myself, but I, what did you, I how dare y'all say I was a bad mother. I would never, ever, ever yeah. admit that because I felt like, um, you know, I was there. I was the one making all the sacrifices for y'all and I was doing A, B, C, and D in my life. You know, um, mm -hmm. I was doing, you don't have a right to call me a bad that I did anything bad. I was yeah. just that was my thought process. Thought process. I'm, not, I'm not gonna admit to anything bad because yeah. hell at least I I was there every day. Yeah. Every day of your life I was there. But mm -hmm. as I started having mm -hmm. uh honest conversations with my children. Yeah. When I started having honest conversations with my children, I had to admit that at times I was a bad parent. Yeah. I was a bad mother. Even it, it doesn't matter that I was doing the best that I could do. There were you things still. that I that I did that uh, caused injury to them, not physical injury. Uh, yeah, but um, mentally, right? Emotionally, right? Mm -hmm. Right. There were behaviors that I had. I know um, a trauma response for me after I lost my mom was um, for some. I had I had these abandonment issues so yeah. i would hold everything just like this yeah it just had to be close to me like i you know no 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 i'm um you know everybody nobody's gonna leave everybody is wow. gonna be close so i held them close but i held them close and i was distant at the same time because i wanted my children to always be with me i wanted to know like everything they did and it's exhausting too to be like that to be look if yeah. you are not healed it will wear you out trying to keep yeah. up with, with all this stuff. So I um I was very protective of them, but then I was very distant from them in an e emotional way. Yeah. So because I had lost somebody, I did not allow them to hug me. Oh wow. Or give me a kiss or anything like that. Like yeah. we did not show want each other or we never did say i love you oh wow. i showed them i showed them because yeah. you know if you whatever you want if if it's in my yeah. power to give it and give right. it to you i'm gonna buy it i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna provide what you need but i don't want you getting too close to me because yeah. my trauma was telling me that whenever i let people get close to me they get taken away yeah that was a trauma response yeah and so, with me, I would say with my uh, not being that good of a mother, I, I knew how to express love. I love my children. I kissed them. I hugged them. I did all those things. But I was abusive in a sense because I used to whip my children because we were whipped and abused. We were whipped with extension cards and, and, and you know, like hangers and extension cards and brooms. And, and so I took some of that in the rearing of my older children. And it, that changed you know, as I, I got the younger ones, but in my thought, um, 
that just the way it was. All my cousins got whipped and I, we got whipped and punished and all of those things. And so it was just normal to whip them. But now I see whipping is, is actually abuse. It's abuse. I mean, I didn't have to say it again. It's abuse. <laughs> whipping children is abuse. Say it again. And so I had to learn that and figure it out because it just makes them angry. Mm -hmm. It doesn't solve what they did wrong. It just, so now I know how to look them in their faces and talk about what they did wrong and how we're going to do better versus pulling out a, a strap and, and whipping them till they got whips all over them. So what, what do you say to people that, because it's a lot of people, mainly people that look like me and you that say, look, whipping, it is necessary. And it, it is a necessary form of discipline. And I got whipped. And mm -hmm. nothing is wrong with me. Oh, uh, yeah, that's what they think. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We just talked about that. It creeps back up on you. You don't yeah, know why does. you're behaving a certain kind of way. And bam, that's it. So we have ways of disciplining our children nowadays with all the luxury and the conveniences they have to, to really hit them to the core without whipping them, taking their cell phones for one, mm -hmm. uh, not letting them go out to the movies, not giving them an allowance, you know, taking away their television time and there's a way of doing it, you know? They want right. a new pair of tennis shoes. Well, you don't get it because you messed up. Making them earn their way versus just giving them everything. So there's ways around it. But I think back in the day, we got a lot of that abuse from, uh, from our ancestors, from them being enslaved and being whipped by their masters. It was just kind of handed down because I know that my... And my family still don't like me to this day for exposing all those secrets. But I know that my grandfather, the reason why my father was so abusive to us, his father was so abusive to them. And then his father was abusive to him. And then it just it just it came on down the line. And all those men beat their wives. All of them. They beat their children. They beat their wives. Where did they get that from? Because in our community, we actually view uh, whippings as a form of protection. And it's not. We, we're going to do this so that we can protect you from this world out here so that you will be right when you go out here. And this will, because you have this form of discipline, you are protected. But the phenomenon behind that or or the psychology behind that actually does come from uh, a slave owner. So, yeah. Uh, and you can see it and you, you can go back and, you know, research it or it. But sometimes they'll show it in some of these movies. Mm -hmm. So if. um a woman had a child on a plantation mm -hmm. and the child did something uh, that the uh, master was upset by and the master wanted to beat that child. The woman would do it, would, would volunteer sometimes or the man or whoever, because they felt like if I do it. Yeah. Yeah. The master, he may, he may kill my child. He may do it. But if I do it, and if I do it with enough force to show him that yeah. I'm, you know, I'm on your side too, I want, you know, because I'm trying to spare my, my child. I don't yeah. want you doing it because I don't know how far you're going to take it, but I yeah. know I can do it with enough force. I know when to stop or whatever. That's, that's where that comes from. Yeah. That's where it so, comes from. You know, we, that's why we think it's a, a, a form of protecting our children like let me do it just let me do it because i'd rather do it at home than let these people out here on the street you know discipline you but that is um uh, one of the reasons why we have so many uh issues that we have i bet if some of these people ask their children like how do you feel or how did you feel when i when i beat you this time with yeah. you whatever you want to call it and they will find out that a lot of times children hold a lot of resentment for those whipping yeah they get they're really angry they're frustrated and and it's even worse when a woman beats her son child because what he yeah said. he's emasculated because he he needs to have that strength and that you know bucking up you know he you know we feel like oh you better not buck up to me but if a woman if a, a woman overpower a male child it emasculates the male and that's why we got so many weak boys growing up because women are single parents and we're emasculating our boys because we're whipping them. We're beating them. We're constricting them. They can't have their manhood grow up in them because we're smothering it down. You're going to listen to me. I don't care what. And I'm going to beat the 
I'm going to beat the masculinity out of you, basically. And that's why it's, it's so detrimental for us to understand that we are creating a, a whole nother group of boys and they're going another way. Right. So that brings me to the chapter in your book and it has baby mama. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, <laughs> baby mama. Back. Yeah, baby mama. Yeah. It's still prevalent. Yeah, it has a uh, baby mama as it as a word in this title, and it talks about being a baby mama. Yeah, and um, <laughs> hot mess. Okay, so a lot of us were our baby mamas. Yeah, and. I don't want to, um, I understand what it takes to make a, make a child. It, it takes two people. Yeah. So I'm not, um, I am not having this, this part of this conversation to blame the woman. Yeah. We're not blaming the woman. Right. But I am saying that since women control the, the, the rights, the, <laughs> biological yeah. rights right um, that we need to be very very selective and this is something you talk about yeah. in your book yeah be very very selective with who we decide to procreate with so yeah. tell me tell me your thoughts and your opinions on this this whole chapter it was yeah. you know it was sort of deep because we yeah. see it and um i try to tell people from my own experience um that uh like no this is this is not the way because um i don't know how people feel about marriage i feel like this and i and i'm, I'm gonna let you have it because a okay. lot of people say well you know marriage it's not for me it's not for me and that could be right because it wasn't for me yeah for the time it, and it wasn't because i couldn't get married it was because right. of why we're talking yeah <laughs> you have to be whole to be going to be, into a union with somebody right, with who don't else. want to go into anything broken so i felt that i was not ready so yeah. you're right marriage is not for you but if you feel like marriage is not for you but having a child yeah then you get without the proper support and, and yeah. a proper upbringing that is for you so just tell me um about your um your thought process when writing that chapter about baby mamas being a baby mama and so on yeah um my thought processes was like it creates a lot of economic hardships in our community it creates a lot of poverty stricken homes it creates the quality of life for the children for the mother especially if you're picking the wrong men and they're just walking away like and then all, it, all of this goes back to slavery. A lot of people don't want to go back to the past, but until you understand where you come from, you can't know where you're headed. And a lot of men today that are procreating and having all these children with all these different uh, women don't realize that they're actually reacting slavery. From the moment the slave master decided this buck was, he was through with his form, he wanted to sell him off to another form where he was married over here. He had children over here. He didn't have a choice. He had to jump from that uh, plantation to the next and make a whole nother family. When he get through with that, they moving him on to the next and on to the next. We don't understand a lot of stuff that we're going through right now is spiritual. So we got a lot of these ties to us, these spiritual strongholds that these brothers are doing. They don't even know why. Like if you ask them, hey, you know, you got, you got 10 kids from five different women or however many why they can't even they couldn't even give you a straight answer because a lot of what we do is is it's subconscious and it's spiritual mm. and so it, once we figure that out you don't have to be that way anymore nobody's taking you from your home nobody's stripping you from taking care of your kids anymore you can stay there and rear these children and be the foundation that they need but that comes along with healing right so right. the whole thing about baby mamas is that it had become so normalized in, in in my era in my community that it was sickening i was sick 
I was sick to my stomach that I wasn't married. I, you know, I had a grandmother in the middle of all of this, and that's what ultimately and ultimately saved my life and helped me go another path was my grandmother because she was speaking words of wisdom and how God was good and 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 I was she was planning to see I ain't want to hear it. I'm like, man, every time I go around granny, she always preaching. You know, just like they do nowadays. They don't want to hear us preaching. And mm -hmm. she was planting seeds and they were growing. And so because she did all that, it, you know, those seeds start to grow. And then I realized God was nowhere in what we were doing. God was not there. He was not in it. Because there is no way we should be procreating with men that we know they're not going to be around. Right. That's going to affect that child or the children. Right, right. And it does, whether we want to admit it or not, um, it doesn't matter if you are um, if you are the best mother and you can provide everything. If you don't have that, this is, you know, from my own experience, you're going to have some trouble down mm -hmm. if they don't have that male uh, influence. Energy. That, that positive. Yeah. Yeah. You know, positive male energy. You, right. You'll have you'll have a problem. And, you know, even if I tell people that don't, don't do it. Don't, don't, do don't it. have, don't, don't have children. When people think about it, it makes me cringe. If you're not married, even if you are married, you can right. be married to the wrong person. Uh huh. And if you have kids and you're married to the wrong person, you're still a single mother. Exactly. So it don't matter if you're married, you got to marry the right person. Somebody right. you know that's in there, in there with somebody, you. somebody that that knows uh, the importance and values what a family is. Right, they and to, they have to be reared right. Right, they do. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes we get with people, and we have these children, and they are just as broken as we are. Yeah, they have all of these issues or whatever. So it's even if probably even if they wanted to stick around, they couldn't yeah. stick around. They could. They have so much stuff going on within themselves that they haven't even addressed yet yeah and how can you be a family you just hit the, the nail on the head about men addressing their mental issues i mean because most of the time women you know if we want our kids to be happy or successful or we realize we're tired of this downward spiral circle then we'll go get some help but most men won't do it most men won't do it. They'll stay damaged from their 20s all the way to their 60s or till they pass away. So what kind of husbands can they make, really? Right, right. And and uh, so for the people who say, you know, are still on the marriage, it's not for me bandwagon. I get that. Mm -hmm. But if you have um, found somebody that mm -hmm. you are in a commit that has committed to you. Right. You know, that has committed to you then that's fine too. As long as you and that person are on the same page and page. you have committed to raising this family that you yeah. need, you need and, to And I call that life partners. Right. Sometimes they're better than marriage, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I, I don't I don't judge people that won't go down the that aisle yeah. or whatever, but if yeah. they're committed to each other and the raising of those children and they're both good for each other, then why mm -hmm. not? Yeah. I'm pretty sure somebody gonna stone me for saying that, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the truth. Yeah, yeah. And and we you have to look at the time where we're in. Um, we're moving uh away from a lot of traditional things mm -hmm. into into new things. So I'm 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 with you on the on the life partner thing. I um I wanted to because it, there's so much in this book. You guys, we're going to have to wrap it up in about maybe 10 more minutes. But I wanted you to move forward into your actual healing process. So we've okay. gotten through the molestation. We've gotten through the rape. We've gotten through running away. We've gotten through um, having children with the wrong people. Yeah. And and it, in the book, you illustrate a pattern. This is a yeah. pattern. It's a pattern. It was a pattern. Sometimes um, you said that you were self-sabotage. You know, mm -hmm. if it was something too good or whatever, you yeah, like it didn't feel right because I didn't deserve it. Right, right. So you were self sabotage, mm -hmm. and so uh, let's get to the point where you said, "Hey, enough is enough." There, enough is enough, and I see a pattern going on here, and it, it is time for me 
to do something because I am responsible for my own healing. It doesn't matter that somebody else hurt me, but if this is something that I have to do for myself, I have to fix myself because they're right. not going to fix me. They're not going to well, fix me. Get to the part where um, you, this is the self-discovery and self-reflection part and tell okay. me how you got to your healing up until where you are right now. Okay. You gave me a big one right now. <laughs> um, well, it was after I had three more children from an abusive man that was a manipulator. He was sick. He was sick. Uh, this man was so bad that I could be trying to rest after working a long day at work and I'd be turned over to my side and he'd get in my ear and he'd whisper hateful slurs to me all night. Wow. That's how evil. But he was breaking me down. He was breaking me all the way down. So... I believe he was sent by the enemy to destroy me, honestly, because see, one thing people don't understand is that the enemy knows your power. He knows your strength. He knows your, he can kind of peek into your future a little bit. And if they can put, if he can put that one person in your life to destroy you and, and to stop your destiny, that's exactly what they, they do. That's why we got to be real careful of the people that we choose to be around us and to walk our journey with us. But mm -hmm. basically he was the evilest person I ever encountered in my whole life. And I had my last three children from this man. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got tired of, uh, I was in my twenties and uh, I noticed I didn't even resemble myself anymore. I noticed that I start to wrinkle and I was losing weight and I was worried and I was stressed. My blood pressure was all over the place. I was miserable. He was trying to kill me. And I just, I just finally, you know, I started praying and I started asking God, you know, what's wrong with me? Like, help me, Lord, because I don't know what's going on. And so the more I seek, because my grandmother used to always say, uh, never forget to pray. So even while I was in my trauma or my mess, I was praying. I was like, God, I need you to help me. I need to know what's going on. Why is it so bad for me? Why do I feel so much pain? And the more I started seeking God earnestly and openly, uh, the more he answered me and the more he told me what to do. And as I was trying to heal, God would, was separating me from this evil man. We, we got to where we couldn't be 30 minutes together. Like we could not spend 30 minutes of our time together because God was pulling us apart. And he pulled us apart long enough for me to start healing. And then I just started healing. I started changing. And the more I started changing, the more I started loving myself, the more I started loving myself, the more I started knowing that I deserved better and that I was worthy of all God's good things, that I didn't have to be abused, that I didn't have to be mistreated and talked to in any kind of way, that I was somebody special because I was God's daughter. But I had to get to a place to where the evilness, I had to, God had to pull it away from me because while I was there, it wasn't going to happen because he had me down low enough to keep me there. So all I can say is um, if it had not been for my grandmother, because if she would have never taught me about the goodness of God and, 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 and all of those things, I wouldn't have had another side to look towards. It would have just been all darkness. So perhaps I wouldn't even be where I'm at today had I not had that testimony of my grandmother. And that's why we have to remember as believers or as people that want to encourage other people, we always have to be that light in that darkness. And that's what she was. She was my light. And it's because of her always saying to me, never forget to pray. I never forgot to pray. Never. And I just kept praying and I prayed my way out of that situation. And um and just all the way to where I am at um, today, I'm a work in progress. Like I say, I still don't really, sometimes I don't sleep well because I have nightmares or I revisit some trauma from the past. And I have to constantly ask God to help me with that. Um, but things have gotten better. I know my worth and I know you probably got to go. Um, we can we get this last part out though. <laughs> and I give, I give back a lot because I find that once I take uh, all the attention off myself, then that's how God is able to free me more. Like I get freer. My heart gets lighter and, and he just takes a lot of stuff away because I think sometimes we just focus on how bad things are that it just mothers us down.
But when we take the attention off of what we're going through and give give it away to somebody else and help somebody else, we're actually healing, helping other people. So, and that's just a shortcut, but that's basically what happened. It was because of my prayer, my prayer life and the belief of in God that helped me separate from this evil person. Okay, so um I want to just go back a little bit because I want to cover um when you say, you know, your our belief or whatever, mm -hmm. because some people, people like to uh, play in semantics and words. So I, I do understand that everybody, not everybody has the same beliefs, religion mm -hmm. or whatever, but it's important for all of us to understand that um, unless you're an atheist, you are, uh, you have something. You look yeah, to some have, kind of source. source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have some kind of source that you look to and that you draw strength from or inspiration mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the same thing. You just may call it something different, mm -hmm. but uh, prayer, meditation, or you know, whatever you want to call it, however you get to your right people. Just but the light for you uh, was your belief and your grandmother. Yeah. When I was reading your book, I almost wanted to call it. I, I like. I, I'm in love with the title "Ghettos Forgotten Daughters," but I all I, uh, almost wanted to say this should have been called. Um, but I had a praying grandmother. <laughs> because, That's right. Yeah, because That's right. You, you, can see it, you can see it sprinkled here and there. When you yeah, mention I always put it in it. Like, and I am a firm believer um, that the prayers or meditations or whatever people want to call them from our ancestors, from people that are no longer here, that have covered us way back then, I mm. believe that they yeah. still work. It that they works. you know they have an, an effect on us so yeah. um you attributed your beliefs to finally getting yeah. you out of yeah. these bad relationships these bad um yeah. you know these cycles breaking these cycles but yeah. you also I, I left some stuff out uh -huh, go um, ahead. i uh i had to teach myself how to have healthy boundaries because mm -hmm. in christianity i was raised a christian in Christianity, that's looked over. Like, uh, with everything that happened from my dad, I was always taught to forgive and move on. And so everybody around me had that mentality that you could just shit all over people. Excuse my French. Mm -hmm. But you could just mess all over people. And and But all your elders would say, hey, you know, it's in the Bible. You got to forgive that person. But there's no healing there for the person that's being abused. There's no healing. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn how to have healthy boundaries. So I had to teach myself. I had to learn. I had to uh, read books that I had never read before, taught me about toxic traits and, and and having healthy boundaries and all these things. I prayed to God. I purged. And, and one thing I will say, healing is very painful. So mm -hmm. I, I ask certain people when they say, you know, I'm healed. I'm good. Okay. Well, was it real painful for you? Oh, no. I just moved on, baby. You're not healed yet. You're not healed. Because <laughs> healing is purging. God is pulling out all that stuff, all that erroneous stuff. Telling you, some people move through life thinking they're fine. Like, yeah. I'm fine. That's it's, how it's I was. In your core. And, and he has to purge it out of you. And it's hard. And you will cry. And you will weep. You probably need to be alone while you're going through that, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he needs you in your alone time to work with you and pull all these bad I idealism is and everything you learned from the past it was all wrong and you have to like almost have god your father refather you or sometimes even remother you and that stuff is painful and so i went through all that and i went through counseling and i went through you know i did my work and it was not easy okay so that was the thing that i was going to get on next the counseling because mm -hmm. first you got to a point and i was trying to find um, this part in your book so that mm -hmm. I could quote directly what you said. Okay. Um, okay, here it is. It says, self-love and self-esteem have to come from within. Right. If you love someone who hurts you to your core every day, then you can't possibly love yourself. So right. you had to get to the point where you started loving yourself mm -hmm. and, you know, realize what it was that you deserved, that you deserved better. Right. And right. then here comes counseling. This is the thing, counseling. Yeah. So tell us about your decision. Although you were on your own journey to healing, why right. did you feel you needed additional help? 
Um, because there's still a lot of things you don't know about yourself. Like even now, um, even now I'm learning, I'm learning so much about myself because we're constantly growing and evolving who you, who you were last year. You're no longer that person. Things are changing about you. And so I just felt like there was some things that were still hidden from me. And there was some layers that I needed to help peel back and kind of heal from, like there was spaces in my life. Like at one point, I thought I was over my trust issues and I wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back to counseling for that because not everybody that walks into your life is, is out to get you or lying to you or trying to hurt you or deceive you. Uh, so going back to counseling, it kind of teaches you how to learn how to trust again and how to do that effectively and efficiently. And so that's why I felt like I had to go back to counseling. And then there's, there may be something come up, I don't know, a year from now that I still have to go and talk to somebody about. And mm -hmm. that's okay because I'm taking charge of my mental health. I want to be healthy. I want to be whole. There were times, and that's why I'm glad it kind of ties into uh, the business network, is that there were times when I was younger, I had big opportunities. But because I was so broken, I couldn't trust anybody to walk through that door. Mm -hmm. So it held me back professionally because I couldn't trust anyone. So that's why I'm glad you had this, this show because it all ties in together. You can miss grand opportunities because you're so untrusting or you're so hurt. You're so full of trauma. You're so full of trauma that you can't walk through those doors of opportunity because you're just not sure. And then sometimes you don't even think you deserve it. Right. You don't, you don't feel like you're worthy. So you're like, this is too good to be true. So you pass it up. Yeah. Yeah. Like so this is too good to be that's true. why we have to heal. And I, I, I talk about it all the time and I know people get tired of hearing it, but I can just, because of what I've been through in my life and the wisdom that I have, I can look at people and tell when they're still broken, when they're still hurting, it's like they're bleeding and I can see it. And I'm like, Oh my God, if you could just acknowledge, mm -hmm. but you know what? So many people, they keep secrets. Yeah. You can't heal with secrets. Because some of the secrets, and I know some of the things you revealed in, in in your book, who wants to to let everybody in on? You know, it it, it makes you vulnerable. It makes you vulnerable. It, it makes you. That's vulnerable. why initially I told God, no, I'm not telling my story. I'm not. No. Nobody wants to be like that, and nobody wants to be uh, put in a position where they could possibly be judged as well. Yeah. Right. Like, oh, where well, you know. But that's the only way to heal, though. <laughs> Like everybody yeah. that holds on to those secrets, they not healed. Yeah, you have to shed all those layers and mm -hmm. you have to come out and you know, you, you have to let it all go, let it all hang out. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it is what it is. And and, and I, what I don't understand is why are we protecting folks that had no business hurting us in the first place? Right. Why are we holding on to that secret? Right. It wasn't right. our fault. And see, that's another thing about me doing a lot of reading and studying. I read this book called Healing the Shame That Binds You. I think it's by Tom Bradshaw. But it taught me about a lot of guilt and shame that I held within from the molestation, the abuse. I mean, just like you said, you experienced your mother being abused. Just being a little bitty child, not able to help your mother save your mother's life, that's trauma. And then it also puts a lot of guilt. Like, I couldn't save her you only two right <laughs> you know so it, it was so much guilt and shame packed into me that i had to learn how to let all that go and it takes a lot of work it does it does and it's important that we do it we have to do our work though so we and, can be and the sooner the sooner that we start doing the work the better um, the community will function as a whole. Yeah, we can be a, a stronger community if we're whole and healthy. Right. Because my daughter's even going through this, and I'll just bring up this as an example. Uh, beautiful young woman had a beautiful young friend, and because of some stuff that maybe she learned from her mother, she can't be really a good friend because she don't know how to. Maybe her mother's never learned how people that are friends, we're not in competition with each other. We love each other and we give to each other and we grow together. We don't have to out top our friends, mm -hmm. but that's how these younger kids are growing up. Well, they're learning that from somebody. Yeah. But that just means we're not whole yet. And we can't help each other. If I think like if, if I have a, a business constituent that I could pass on to you, but I'm looking at you and saying, I ain't giving her that. She can make 20 grand off of that. 
Yeah, because we have been 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 indoctrinated to be uh, competitors instead of comrades. Mm-hmm. So it's supposed to be a camaraderie, not a competition. Right. <laughs> and yeah. you know, and that goes back to us being healthy because we would know we're in this together. If right. you have one black millionaire, what about all the poor po- po- poverty stricken people that are homeless? Right. Then we're all still losing because they don't separate us. You know who I, what I mean by they. Right. They don't separate us. They group us all into one pile. And, and that's another way we've been trained too, because we are focused on self. It is it's self, and so we we rarely rarely move as a collective in anything. Uh, mm-hmm. We can we might start off, and then that thing is falling all apart. Everybody, yeah. like, oh, come on, I'm gonna do me. People <laughs> nasty talking about each other. I don't know what you're gonna do, but I'm I'm finna go on and do me because yeah. we just can't keep it together and. That's an indication of how much work we need to do because mm-hmm. we can never keep anything all the way together. That thing is just falling apart as soon as we get out the door. Yeah. And then the so, business fails because nobody trusts nobody and nobody right. wants to see the other one win. Right. Right. <laughs> so so um, everybody, it is a little bit over the hour. <laughs> we went over. Well, you know, this is a this is a, a conversation that needs to be had. Actually, we we you know we could probably talk about this all day. Yeah, um, because so a lot we didn't even hit the you know. Yeah, it's a lot. Them. It's a lot. Yeah. So again, uh, Marion Wallace, her book is Ghettos, Forgotten Daughters. Before we log off, I want Marion to let everybody know where they can purchase her book, and I want you to also let people know. Um, what you're doing in a community, what you're doing with your business or whatever. Tell them what area you're in because I didn't tell them that. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Well, um, my name is Marion Wallace. I'm in Houston, Texas, and I um, I help youth. My 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 passion is to help uh, teenagers and young women, um, you know, kind of grow from erroneous teachings and erroneous thought patterns so they can grow up and do something amazing with their lives to edify God and to have a great life themselves. So that's my passion. If if I could just work in my passion, I wouldn't even do my businesses. My business is I have a, a, a tax office and I have a, a real estate business. And so this is this alone is a testimonial because I come from nothing. I come from the bottom and I, I dropped out of school. You're looking at a high school dropout that went back to college and got two degrees. And now I have two businesses and I try to be the best version of myself every single day and I, I help other people. I give to a fail sometimes, but it just shows how God can go in and show up and show out. Uh, you can get my book at, um, let's see, restoring ghettos forgotten, uh, com. I think that's it. I want to give that right to you. Can you type it in the chat? Yeah, I'll type it in. Okay. Type it in the chat. Okay, let's see here. Will it let me in there? I'll try it here. Okay. Oh. Is people still on or are they gone already? Uh uh-uh, <laughs> they're still on. Okay. As long as they can see us, they, they stayed on. Okay. <laughs> I hope that's the one. I don't want to be giving you the wrong thing. Let me type it in right here. It's ghettosforgottendaughters.com. Oh, ghettosforgottendaughters.com. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Yay. It's .com. Okay. So that's where you can get the book. Okay. And I'll make sure to... Um... Is it ghettosforgottendaughters.com or restoring? Just ghettos. Oh, I did it wrong. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to put it, I'll put it in. A, you said ghettos. Forgotten Orders.com. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. P H E T T O S. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> Dot com. That should be it right there. Ghettos Forgotten Daughters.com. Yeah. Okay. But on that page, you can go and um, check out some articles and, um, order the book. You can even leave messages and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. But that's so, pretty much it. Okay. So I appreciate everyone who tuned in tonight. I'm not sure what we're going to do next week. 
I'll um, announce it, but I would like Marion to come back in the future um, okay. so that we could continue this conversation and we don't necessarily have to talk about her book, but we're just going to talk about um, things that are related to this book because right. this is a conversation that um, it needs to be continuing. Um, yeah. we, we, we can't just cover this in, in an hour. So yeah. <laughs> um, I'll bring her back soon. I appreciate everybody for um, tuning in tonight. I thank you, Marion, for coming. You're welcome. Thank and, you for having me. Um, everybody, go out and go to giddosforgottendaughters.com and purchase the book so that you can read Marion's story. So on that note, we are out and I will see you guys next week. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye.